My name's Kate Mason, and over the last few years, I've been looking at the synthetic transformation of the global food systems. We're explicitly being told through United Nations and government documents that synthetic is sustainable. In this video, I specifically look at how the global chemical and sea companies with the United Nations and philanthropist partners are moving into the regenerative agricultural space. At COP27, the United Nations National Climate Change Conference held in 2022, representatives from CGIAR, CropLife, and the World Farmers Association came together to give a talk on multi-stakeholder partnerships to tackle the global food crisis through regenerative agriculture. The event was hosted by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, Rockefeller and CGIAR. You can sit through an hour of their dialogue and listen to terms being thrown around such as equity, incentivizing, farmer-led, but you won't hear what these organizations are really invested in or their track records or what they're really planning. In this video, I unpack what they are really saying behind their innocuous words and why it's important to pay attention and what they are really hiding under the cover of regenerative farming principles. Under this next iteration of big ag transformations, synthetic food is being equated with better for the climate. And as farmers will soon need to account for their carbon drawdown and emissions to be able to keep functioning, it's important that any farmer or consumer of organic food pays attention to this imminent trap. At the World Economic Forum, the 1,000 largest corporates in the world, and for that think Pepsi, Big Pharma, chemical companies, bankers, tech, conglomerates are interested in regenerative farming, which through the COP27 talk is spoken about as crop cover, no tilling, usage of animals, building soil carbon, to name a few components. At COP27, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, CGIAR, and the Rockefeller Foundation hosted the Food and Agricultural Pavilion. The FAO, the Food and Agricultural Arm of the United Nations, in 2022 had a partnership with CropLife to transform the world's food systems. CropLife is covered later in the video. They are the largest chemical and seed companies in the world. The Food and Agricultural Organization are proponents of synthetic food, lab meat, highly processed plant proteins, genetically edited crispered crops and animals, which is synthetic biology. They purportedly work for the 194 member countries on food and agriculture, and these countries are beholden to the Food and Agricultural Organization to supply information about food and agriculture. Utilizing their mass fortune arising from oil, the Rockefeller Foundation was instrumental in foisting the green revolution on unwilling farmers through monoculture crops, chemicals and GMOs. And CGIAR is a global partnership body focusing on food security. They have been instrumental in holding and patenting the world's seeds. The COP27 focus on food and agriculture was welcomed by investors worth $18 trillion. Investors and air quotes philanthropists are champing at the bit to control even more of the world's food systems. And yes, philanthropists make profits. There are a number of talks focusing on food and agriculture at COP27. I am focusing on the one called multi-stakeholder partnerships to tackle the global food crisis through regenerative agriculture. First, we learn about the companies which the speakers represent and their track records. Then I discuss how the food and agricultural issues are defined, what solutions are championed, how the entities are planning to implement these solutions and how they are selling the solutions to an unwitting public. I focus on Australian government involvement and how the global plans are being implemented through government policy and legislative changes. Whatever country you are in, this is a global lockstep approach, so it will still be relevant to see how the system is implemented from global to local. Let's start with an introduction to the speakers and the organizations they represent. So let me uh, first of all introduce you to uh, the distinguished participants today that we're going to have in our panel and our conversation about uh, how can we approach a multi-stakeholder approach to drive regenerative agriculture in the context of the food crisis that we are also experiencing at this time. Dr. Anna-Maria 
Lobo Guerrero is the head of global research and policy at CGIR. Giampiero Menza. Giampiero is the senior manager of partnerships and Innova Inno innovative finance at CGIR. And uh, in his prior roles, he also covered a key role at uh, UNDP, looking at private sector partnerships, in particular, how to create shared value through a multi-stakeholder approach to solutions. With Romano De Vivo, who is the Vice President of Sustainability at Crop Life, Angeli Maroc as the Head of Global Responsibility at Corteva, Nelson Gottfried Agemon is the CEO of the Coalition of Farmers from Ghana. He's also a member of the World Farmers Organization and uh, drives, in particular, the topic of innovation. He's also an expert in multi-stakeholder approaches in uh, driving, basically, several agricultural areas, in particular, around ecosystem restoration as well. And finally, a word about myself, uh, Alessandro Cataldo, I'm a partner in EY. I'm responsible for our agricultural practice, uh, and uh, I'm a farmer myself. Juan Lucas Restrepo is the Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity. CGIAR has been instrumental in collecting and storing vast amounts of seeds from around the world. In 2004, CGIAR and FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, established Crop Trust to collect and store seeds. Crop Trust supports Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Australia financially supports Crop Trust. The seeds that are collected are then genetically engineered and patented by powerful interests. Under the guise of food insecurity, genetically engineered seeds are churned out to speed up the plant's natural cycles. The latest iteration of this seed capture is under climate safe agriculture. Genes are edited through CRISPR technologies and sold as working with nature. This is only the last iteration of the corporate capture of seed. The article One Empire Over Seed explains, a great seed and biodiversity piracy is underway. When the Green Revolution was brought into India and Mexico, farmers' seeds were rounded up from their fields and locked in international institutions to be used to breed Green Revolution varieties, engineered to respond to chemical inputs. CGIAR is controlled by Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Bank. Besides taking control of the seeds of the farmers in the CGIAR seed banks, Gates and Rockefeller is investing heavily in collecting seeds from across the world and storing them in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's otherwise called the Doomsday Vault. Concerns about seed piracy through the FAO were raised back in the 1970s. Erna Bennett worked for the Food and Agricultural Organization and was passionate about seed conservation. She became increasingly alarmed about the privatisation of seed stock by powerful private interests. She battled to keep private corporate interests out of the United Nations and was forced out of her position in 1982. Natural seeds cannot be patented. Genetically edited seeds can be. Once seeds are patented, our food stock is centrally controlled. The Australian government heavily supports the CGIAR the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research and CGIAR work closely together. They call it an enduring partnership, one where Australia is within the top 10 investors into the CGIAR. The CGIAR pours money into genetic innovation, biotechnology, system transformation, how to make all the parts work together, and resilient agri-food systems, again biotech, nanotech, data, technology, etc. CropLife is heavily invested in biotechnology and they state, biotechnology allows scientists to maintain and improve crop and pasture productivity by modifying plants in ways not always possible using conventional breeding techniques. Crop biotechnology has the potential to produce novel products from plants, improve their nutritional quality, increase productivity, and adapt crops to environmental stresses resulting from a changing climate. Some of the future innovations they discuss include synthetically adding vitamin infused substances into crops, improving the shelf life so making food last longer, the texture and the flavor of food, breeding apples, tomatoes, bananas um, and potatoes that don't brown and other genetically edited variations. 
some of the claims they make around this new climate safe variations of seed so that it can grow better in droughts and in flooding and that it can handle pests it can kill pests and insects better so it's more it's better for biosecurity threats very similar to claims made during the green revolution these arguments have been challenged by small farmers and non-GMO groups around the world for decades based on the fact that natural seeds that have been grown through generations in small farmers' hands actually do acclimatise to the climate of the countries that they're growing in. So who are CropLife? Well, CropLife Australia's members represent 85% of crop protection, so chemicals, and 95% of crop biotech products used by Australian farmers. CropLife are the likes of Bayer, Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, Corteva and other powerful chemical and biotech interests. It should give traditional regenerative farmers pause to see Bayer is now scaling up regenerative agriculture. You can pause on the screen here to see some of the products that CropLife is developing at the moment and see how comfortable you feel that CropLife has tasked themselves with transforming the world's global food systems. The article Global Seed Industry Changes Since 2013. Dow and DuPont merge ChemChina and um, acquires Syngenta, Bayer acquires Monsanto, Bayer's seed divisions were sold to BASF, these four firms are now estimated to control over 60% of global seed sales. Also talking is Nelson Gottfried Agiamung, who's representing the Coalition of Farmers Ghana and also the World Farmers Organization. Australia is represented through the World Farmers Organization with the National Farmers Federation being a member. The World Farmers Organization has a number of projects. One is Climakers, and the World Farmers Organization goes to great pains to say that they are bottoms up, they're farmer driven, farmer led, etc. When we look at who they're associated with, CropLife is instantly top of page, CGIAR, and other big global partnership organizations. And here again, we can see their partnerships, including the likes of the Rockefeller Foundation, IKEA, and other large partnerships of corporate vested interests. How they make this look bottoms up is that Regen 10 and the like train. Here they're talking about 500 million farmers around the world. And finally, we have consultancy company EY represented. EY works with financial service organizations across the globe to define their transition to a more sustainable future. Through the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and under the guise of climate change, companies need to start reporting on sustainability metrics through ESG scoring. What this means is that companies will not do business with farms that do not have a good sustainability score, which is now an issue when we consider that sustainability is now linked to synthetic biology and agri-chemical processes. So let's listen to Alessandro, EY partner and also farmer, amazingly, how he frames the problems of the world's food systems. When you look at how the green revolution panned out in the history of mankind, there were two fundamental events that happened suspiciously very close to inflection points into our emissions, you know, for, uh, into the atmosphere as well. Uh, the first one around the 1920s, when a gentleman by the name of John Deere invented basically the reverse plow. And, and then later on, during the Green Revolution in the 40s, when we started using that technology to you know, basically till at increasingly rates our prairies, which were fantastic carbon sinks that we had around the world as well. Um, grasses are able to you know, grow much more their organic matter below ground than above ground. So what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. And this is quite amazing. So what happens when you till soils? You basically expose the lower levels of the soil with all that organic matter to oxygen. And what happens then? 
basically bacteria and fungi start having a feast and digesting it. And when they digest it, they release carbon dioxide and methane, basically, into the atmosphere as well. The documentary, The Worm, is turning documents, the narrative at the time when the Green Revolution was introduced. Just pay attention to how they speak about the necessity for the Green Revolution. Most of the soil life on commercial farms in this country is dead. If people really knew what's going on with the soil, what's going on with the plants, what's going on inside of our bodies, people would freak out. They'd be scared. The trap is so intense that they are unable to come out of it. By 1980, there will be over 4 billion. Food production must keep pace with this rapidly growing world population. It's not about the more food, it's about power. The reason that a billion people are going hungry is not because of a shortage of food. So under this next iteration that these players are talking about, feeding the world and climate change are the two main reasons why they speak about ne needing to do this next iteration into synthetic biology under the cover of regenerative agriculture. We even find the Rockefeller Foundation in their Reset the Table meeting the moment to transform the US food system report acknowledging the green revolution left a legacy of overemphasis on staple grains at the expense of more nutrient-rich foods reliance on chemical fertilizers that deplete the soil and overuse of water the rockefeller foundation was instrumental in the green revolution and still funds the green revolution in africa the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa is financed by the likes of the United Nations under a few different programs. They have Bayer and other chemical companies um, in there as private sector partners. Main funders include Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to try to combat the chemical laden GMO crops which have been introduced under AGRA. The AFSA has come together to try to push back on the powerful corporate interests and the ramifications on the African farming community. We are here to state clearly and categorically that the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa does not speak for Africans. We seek investment in a form that is democratic and responsive to the people at the heart of agriculture, not as a top-down force that ends up concentrating power and profit into the hands of a small number of multinational companies. The report False Promises the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa states... In 2006, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation launched AGRA. Armed with high-yield commercial seeds, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, it was touted as being able to deliver Africa its own green revolution in crop production to reduce hunger and poverty. Therefore, AGRA funds various projects and lobbies African governments for the development of policies and market structures that promote the adoption of green revolution technology packages which actively pushes policies that open the doors to green revolution inputs, including seeds and pesticides, and prevents alternative approaches from receiving support. So back to Alessandro as he documents more disturbances arising from the green revolution. And you'll note that he starts to talk about we need to start working with nature. How did we react to this? How did we react to this? We reacted by seeing a degradation on the yields, you know, after plowing. We started introducing more and more fertilizers and in order to make up for decreases in yields. Uh, plants got stressed, biotic and abiotic stress as well due to climate change. And we started to intervene also with other measures as well, which basically held our productivity up. But, you know, the problem is we're working against nature here. And maybe we should spend a bit of time looking at how nature actually fixes itself and creates an ecosystem. Let's look beyond the pretty words about working with nature to see what the corporate entities represented at this talk are invested in, namely synthetic biology, nanotech and data surveillance technologies. Let's listen to crop life now. We are talking about uh, a transformation and the transformation is not only in the name. If we look back to the last uh, 55 years, 
from Green Revolution to nowadays, we had uh, mainly conservation agriculture that was mainly focusing on the crops, while regenerative agriculture is really calling for a convergence of uh, crops, pastures, livestock, but also a convergence of different practices, of different technologies all together. Because this convergence is really the transformation that we need. But also to think about the long-term transformation that cannot happen without all the tools. And this is why I'm very grateful to Alexandro that started this conversation with the policy element. Because the policy element needs also to allow us to open up the farm to all the different technologies, to all the different practices, to a mix of everything we know, of all the knowledge, and give us the possibility also as private sector to support really the transfer of knowledge at local level. This is really fundamental. So CropLife wants government policy to open up the farm to the chemical companies and their newly emerging technologies. And this includes synthetic biology CRISPR. Corteva, who are represented on the panel, um, join forces with Pairwise to accelerate gene editing and advance climate resilience in agriculture. They sell it that it's going to benefit farmers, the environment and everyday consumers, which many refute. They state gene editing is poised to revolutionise agriculture, enabling the cultivation of crops that are more adaptive to climate change and more nutritious and convenient for consumers. The novel editing tool allows scientists to precisely tailor a wide range of genetic variation to develop new, distinctive plant varieties much faster and more effectively than through conventional breeding alone. Note that conventional and natural food sources and seeds are now in a paradigm where natural is worse and gene edited is better for the climate. Soil and carbon drawdown is one of the areas where the synthetic fix is touted as better than natural organic methods. Let's listen to Alessandro representing EY to hear more. I started a journey in this particular space 12 years ago when I turned one of my farms into an organic farm and completely focused on regenerative agriculture. I lost money for eight years. My yields plummeted. I could not sell my produce at a profit. And after eight years, my yields started going up and something had changed. And what had changed was the soil. It had reconstituted itself. When I started looking at the samples of the soils that I had, you know, after eight years of this exercise, and plowing tons of organic matter into our fields, and I compared it to the samples I had from you know, eight years before, it was as if they were coming from two different planets. One was soil, a living you know, ecosystem of organisms. It even smelled different. The other one was dirt. It was mineral, it was lifeless. The reality is, with all my best efforts, with the technology that I have today, and plowing tons and tons of organic matter into my fields, I was able to increase my soil organic carbon content by 0.01% at maximum per year. To make a material change, it will take me decades. This is not good enough. So the challenge is, how can we speed up the process? Note that organic processes take too long and the process needs to be sped up. The problem here is how can we accelerate a natural process of mineralization of carbon in the soils? Because if you can achieve that, you know, and speed up that process, soils contain nearly three times the amount of carbon which is currently in all living plants around the world and in the atmosphere. And we can actually you know, use soils as big carbon sinks to basically speed up, you know, reverse potentially our climate condition and go into what are called drawdown as well, very quickly. And this is probably where different sectors need to come together. Where do you think this, you know, competences are sitting, apart from crop science companies, apart from agricultural experts? They sit also in the chemical industry, they sit in the pharma industry, they sit in the biotech industry as well. They can help us actually find concerted solutions to, you know, to uh, this particular problem. One of the solutions the chemical companies and the biotech engineers are interested in is nanotechnology. Nanoscale particles could potentially help address agricultural and environmental sustainability issues on a global scale, says CropLife. 
Nano-enabled agriculture for sustainable soil. At the nanoscale, innovative approaches can enhance the efficiency of agrochemical utilisation, offering resource recovery options and employing targeted delivery and slow release strategies. Additionally, nanotechnology can contribute to the improvement of soil and plant health through microbiome enhancement, facilitates advanced crop management by integrating nanosensors into plants, and mitigate losses by enhancing crop resilience and efficiency. Nanotechnology holds promise for the third agricultural revolution. What are nanomaterials? They are particles characterized by at least one dimension below 100 nanometers. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. By creating nano-sized pores or channels between soil aggregates, nanoparticles can enhance water drainage and aeration in the soil. They're being touted as the miracle fix to change everything from greenhouse gas emissions to soil aeration to microbiome of the soil facilitation. What's often glossed over is that because of the tiny, tiny particles that make up the nanoparticles, they can cross the blood-brain barrier, they can coat the lungs, there are many issues and many other concerns. Potential consequences of nanoparticles on the agricultural ecosystem. Nanoparticles can reduce uptake and transport of water within plants, as well as influence critical metabolic pathways and photosynthesis. Hazards and risks associated with NPs encompass an increased DNA damage, genotoxic effects, harm to human organs and tissues, adverse effects on the growth and yield of crop plants, and negative impacts on microorganisms in the environment. So what are the possible dangers of nanotechnology? Disturbingly, researchers have spent a great deal of time and money investigating new applications for nanotechnology, but relatively little has been spent on research into the effects of these particles on human health and the environment. Elements behave differently when made on an extremely small scale, so they may react to their environment in unexpected ways like entering the body in ways that they could not before, affecting the brain or other tissues. Nanoparticles can often penetrate the skin, enter the bloodstream via the lungs and cross the blood-brain barrier. Once inside the body, there may be further biochemical reactions, such as the creation of free radicals that damage cells and DNA. Another issue is that while the body has built-in defences for natural particles it encounters, nanotech is introducing entirely new substances that the body would not recognise or be able to deal with. Back in 2004, the Australian public wants greater scrutiny of nanotechnology, a recent citizens panel on nanotechnology has heard. Some participants said they were concerned about the safety of carbon nanotubes, asking whether they could be the new asbestos. These concerns were poo-pooed by the head of the CSIRO Nanotechnology Division. He said while well, they entered the blood system, it was unclear whether this made them dangerous. I don't know of any firm evidence that there are major problems, he told the panel. 20 years on, and very, very few Australians would even be aware of nanotechnology and its implications. The Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, the APVMA in Australia, are tasked with regulating nanotechnology in agriculture, animals and pesticides. And the Fazan's body regulates nanotech in food. Both of these organisations seem primarily concerned with not standing in the way of industry profits and emerging technologies. So the fact that they have oversight is disturbing. Recently, a damning report was released that the APVMA was captured by corporate interests. This report was released during the time that the APVMA allowed fipronil, a banned insecticide in many countries, to be put through the New South Wales bush as part of the failed attempt to kill a mite. At least 40 million bees were killed, I think that was on the very low side of the numbers that were killed, through the Department of Primary Industries, and fipronil was released with seemingly no environmental oversight on the long-term repercussions. Additionally, the APVMA had been reviewing the safety of fipronil for over 20 years with no final report when they allowed it to be put into the natural environment. Fazans is in the process, as we speak, of amending the definition of GMO to allow a large amount of genetically edited and modified food to be allowed into the food systems without testing or labeling. There are many plans to synthetically alter the microbiomes within the soil. 
Recent advances in microbial ecology and synthetic biology have the potential to mitigate damage caused by anthropogenic activities that are impacting the Earth's soil's ecosystems. Again, we see that synthetic biology of plants and microbiomes is associated with sustainable agriculture. Australia is part of a global soil partnership run through the Food and Agricultural Organisation of the United Nations. And the chair of the Pacific Soil Partnership is Peter Wilson from the CSIRO. The CSIRO is the Australian Government's scientific and industrial research organisation, which partners extensively with private biotechnology companies. The Food and Agricultural Organisation has recently launched the International Network on Soil Fertility and Fertilisers. They want to make the soil healthy and fertile by 2030 as a part of transforming the agri-food systems and they want voluntary guidelines for sustainable soil management. But not so voluntarily, they are advocating for the inclusion of soil fertility and soil health in the legal framework of countries in relation to the One Health approach. Why is this an issue? Because sustainable is now linked to synthetic. In Australia, we have the National Soil Strategy, which was released in the last few years. This is all part of Agenda 2030, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and additionally, obligations that Australia has signed up to under the Food and Agricultural Organisation Charter for Soils. The Australian government is going to map the soils in Australia and they want to quantify soil carbon stocks to better link soil carbon contents to management practices. The National Soil Action Plan 2023 to 2028 states, support the measurement, monitoring, mapping, reporting and sharing of soil state and trend information to inform best practice management, decision making and future investment in soil and accelerate the adoption of land use and management practices that protect soil and improve soil state and trend. The goal by 2041 is increased sustainable use of soil to meet contemporary needs. Agriculture and trade policies that incentivize and reward good soil management and stewardship will encourage landholders and land managers to improve their soil. And the CSIRO has given this report a tick of approval. CSIRO has the Synthetic Biology Transformation Roadmap for Australia and the National Farmers Federation is fully on board. The incentivising and decentivising strategy that the Australian government is going to come up with means that unless you go along with certain soil practices um, and they will be synthetic, increasingly synthetic, people will be unable to stay in or struggle to stay in the market. I unpack the incentivising, decentivising strategy a bit further along in this video. The utilisation of Internet of Things for smart farms where everything that's on the farm, including the soil, is hooked up to the Internet and communicating in real time. To illustrate the technology innovations that are being prepared for farmers, we can look at CGIAR, Accelerate for Impact and Impact Lab Solutions. Solutions such as Yields app, artificial intelligence based technology that provides a precise diagnosis of pest disease and soil health together with the exact courses of action to take. Smart BAC optimizes the collection and transport of milk by offering a solution that preserves product quality while ensuring real-time traceability for value chain stakeholders. AgriScan Morocco. AgriScan develops and produces new portable sensors offering real-time soil analysis through a technology of embedded and network connected artificial intelligence for data storage and analysis. Intellexia, providing remote and real-time monitoring of the entire chain for perishable products. PCS Agri, a solution that estimates tomato yields, detects the first outbreaks of problems and optimizes the use of pesticides using video captures and artificial intelligence.
AgriCapture connects conscious consumers to the farmers and locations where crops are grown, ensuring traceability and transparency, combination of smartphones, digital weighing scales, QR codes and digital payments to ensure the processing of raw goods is fully traceable and accurate. Remember, synthetic is now sustainable. This is all about surveillance on farmers to bring in new technologies and biotech. And farmers are going to be tracked and traced through all their processes to ensure they are sustainable. The AI and data collection, of course, uses exorbitant amounts of energy, but this is rarely discussed. So this is sounding really nasty and nonsensical. To be sustainable, processes and products need to be synthetically altered, patented, centrally controlled, and nanotech needs to be embedded within farms. Animals, plants, soil, machinery need to be hooked up to the internet and analyzed in real time. So how are they going to capture farmers within this web? Well, they're going to do it through public-private partnerships and multi-stakeholderism, which is going to dictate to government policies and legislation which incentivize and enforce these requirements. Let's listen to Juan, the representative for CGIA, talk about multi-stakeholder partnerships. And we're here to talk about multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships. In this case, uh, from the FAO, the Food Ag Agriculture Organization, Rockefeller uh, Foundation, and the group uh, the, of centers I represent, uh, CGIAR. That's an amazing net network of 12 international research organizations that's bringing together all of its capacities on what we're calling one CGIR. It's gonna be very difficult to do it the conventional way, top-down ways, unidirectional ways. And there is clearly, and this is a conclusion that's emerging, uh, not uh, a one silver bullet, not one formula that will do the job, but a number of elements in a recipe. We can think about like a big soup where we some bring the potatoes, some bring the chicken, the meat, the, the vegetables, etc. And it's that you know pot of food uh, what really uh, embraces complexity and help, help, can help us uh, move uh, move uh, forward. So we're, st we're talking about multi-stakeholder partnerships. We're talking about regenerative agriculture, and we're going to hear some examples on what that is. And it's not the same in the minds of everybody. So that's going to be. Uh, clear in the in the conversation, uh, private sector and how private sector leveraging private sector uh, is going to be critical to tackle uh, this uh, food and, and climate crisis. Yeah. We're not going to meet if we don't do anything our uh, hunger zero targets. The targets he is talking about are under the 17 Sustainable Development Goals through the United Nations. The two that are mostly discussed for food and agriculture are Sustainable Development Goal number two, Zero Hunger, and Sustainable Development Goal number 13, Climate Action. All of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals sound good on the surface, but when you scratch the surface, it leads to centralized control and in relationship to food and agriculture, it leads to synthetic biology and painted products. The last SOFI report that was recently announced is talking about 800 million people going hungry. And this is 10% of the world's population and it's up 150 million from where it was two years back. And things during 2022 are clearly not making things better. So we are facing a huge hunger crisis that as we are hearing and will hear through these days is intimately related with climate. And One of the main reasons that people would be doing a lot worse in 2022 than 2020 was the pandemic policies where the wealth of the world's 10 richest men doubled during the pandemic. Meanwhile, 99% of the world's population were worse off because of lockdowns. But that's never discussed in a meaningful way because, as we've been told repeatedly, COVID necessitated the Great Reset, the Building Back Better, which is, of course, more centralised control through the Fourth Industrial Revolution, of which synthetic biology is a cornerstone. 
As CJIR started to build its agenda, its 2030 agenda and its, its new uh, research portfolio, we understood very clearly that we could not do it uh, if it not were in partnership. And this is how we've been uh, organizing ourselves in a portfolio of research that more and more through bringing partners as equals on board will not only leave better outcomes, stronger partners, but will have those partners better express in the future their needs, not to CGIR, but to their governments, uh, uh, understand needs from farmers, uh, local communities, etc. So we, we are deploying this uh, concept that's called capacity sharing for development. In a nutshell, capacity development means training as many people as possible to follow the CGIAR position and interests and influence policy makers, that is government, to transform the global food systems the CGIAR way. It's a crafty way to make it seem like the people themselves are calling for corporatized control of the world's food systems. And the second one, second element is by doing this, this we are definitely going to enhance this neural network of, of partnerships between the public uh, uh, sectors, science to science, science to policy. But if we don't develop uh, connectors, connections that are not necessarily fully there with the private sector, we will not get too far. So as we will also hear today, private sector is critical and how we link science with entrepreneurship is something that uh, we are learning how to do and we'll, we'll hear uh, some experiences and where uh, our interest is also to uh, support those solutions. So effort that Gian Piero will talk to you about is called Accelerate for Impact, which is another way of business as unusual for, for CGIR. So neural networks of partnerships Let's look at what sort of partnership CGIAR is involved in. CGIAR works with over 3,000 partners in nearly 90 countries around the world to advance the transformation of food, land and water systems in a climate crisis. This is done under the cover of meeting the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Partnerships such as those with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, longtime partner and funder of CGIAR, took a step forward in addressing a financial gap by announcing $1.4 billion to fund immediate and long term initiatives that will help smallholder farms in sub Saharan Africa and South Asia. This funding will capture farmers by using big data and digital platforms. Under the guise of helping small farmers, Gates Ag 1 will improve plant biology, that is, foist genetically engineered patented products onto farmers. You can see that they are involved with traditional staple grains. I will come back to cowpea further along in this video. The CGIAR Accelerate for Impact platform, which brings together ag tech and venture capital firms. The amount of investment bankers and techies involved in this space is mind-blowing. It's a shift away from traditional research as it is just full steam ahead for synthetic biology with massive capital behind it. Partners of this program include the World Bank, GIZ, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Impact Lab and Rockstart. CGIAR Accelerate for Impact Platform and L Venture Group forge a strategic partnership to support the next generation of agri-food and climate tech startups. From precision farming, which is um, synthetic farming, this is CRISPR, from precision farming to disease and drought resistant plants to food tech and nutraceuticals, there are multiple solutions that can lead the way in shaping a new phase of agriculture. This is about ag biotech, bioenergy, biomaterials, farm management, software, IoT solutions, and novel farming systems. To look at how these partnerships and funding models influence government policies and practices, I will use Bayer Monsanto's soybean trajectory as an example. In 2021, Bayer launched Extend Flex soybeans, which are tolerant to dicamba, glyphosate, and glufosinate herbicides. 
This is combined with another herbicide with vapor grip technology, a restricted use pesticide. The fourth and fifth iteration of these products includes tolerance to another two herbicides. And by the early 2030s, Bayer Monsanto expects to, that its soybeans will be tolerant to another herbicide on top of this. When they say tolerant to herbicides, it means that you can spray these poisons and chemicals all over the crop. Everything else dies except for the, the soybean crop itself, meaning that we're eating a huge amount of herbicides and chemicals. Dicamba kills crops that are not tolerant to dicamba. Glyphosate kills crops that are not tolerant to glyphosate. Glufosinate will kill crops that are not tolerant to glufosinate. Bayer Monsanto invests up to $2.6 billion annually into research and development, meaning they pay for the science, the scientists and the research findings. Then we have in Australia, Soybean Program aims to boost national production. The Grains Research and Development Corporation will invest $3 million in a new five-year soybean breeding program, which aims to deliver new elite soybean varieties to Australian growers. This is already occurring in Queensland and New South Wales and they're going to expand into central Queensland and South Australia. Grains Research and Development Corporation is funded by the Australian Government. Why it's important for GRDC to invest in discovery. A significant feature of the GRDC Bayer Herbicide Innovation Partnership is the fact that it deliberately targets the discovery end of the long herbicide chemistry development pipeline. Australia has grown into the single biggest cereal market for Bayer and one of our most important single country markets in the world, says Bayer. That scale means it's a market that should be front of mind when it comes to herbicide development. The Herbicide Innovation Partnership has seen Australia promoted to a priority one country in Bayer's Global Herbicide Development Program. And that's how public-private partnerships work. Private interests capture government. Government creates policies which benefit the private interests and the public pays for it. We have a, a clear a challenge, clear mandate. The recipe for this soup means and, and requires multi-stakeholder partnerships and that's what we're going to hear about uh, today. Multi-stakeholder partnerships is sustainable development goal number 17. It's where private interests form a dizzying array of networks with the same actors funding the networks, so it appears as though a range of interests are being represented. Small farmers and consumers of food are represented by non-government organisations who, by the main, tow the corporate interest line. An example being the United Nations Food Systems Summit, exposing corporate capture of the UN Food Systems Summit through multi-stakeholderism. Multi-stakeholderism allows powerful transnational corporations, their platforms and associations, to direct international and national policy making, financing, narratives and governance while promoting corporate friendly false solutions to food systems in crisis. Exposing corporate capture of the UNFSS through multi-stakeholderism. And you can see that most influential stakeholders in 26 food, agriculture and nutrition, multi-stakeholder initiatives, business and industry are top. Then we have the so-called experts, academics, paid for academics and research institutes paid for by business, UN bodies and philanthropists. Philanthropists which have private interests which benefit from their philanthropic investments. Corporate colonisation, small producers boycott UN Food Summit, small scale farmers and indigenous groups say Big Ag offers only false and self-interested solutions. The UN has given the private sector a dominant role in almost every part of the summit which will lead to transnational corporations and their allies in the non-profit and philanthropic sectors having greater scope to direct food policies, finance and government. As a result, solutions will be market-led, piecemeal, voluntary and heavily weighted towards increasing food production through capital investments, big data and proprietary technologies. This will enable a handful of corporations and individuals to expand control over the global food system to the further detriment of the vast majority of people and the planet. The UN has provided a cover of legitimacy for corporations to capture the narrative and deflate public pressure. It has not been an honest broker. Private interests directing government policy. 
Let's listen to the representative of CropLife explain how this works. But also I see that uh, uh, sometimes the policy is not fully supportive of what is needed at farm level. And uh, many importing countries are looking at uh, what they consider sustainability for themselves and not what is sustainability at local level. So agriculture is something local. So if we are talking about regenerative agriculture, we need to think about how it can be implemented at local level, what are the elements for local level, and we need to make sure that uh, we do not impose from perhaps rich country to developing countries sustainability criteria. This would be a big mistake. So perhaps it's a good question to start with. I mean, uh, definitely we should uh, make sure that the policy is supportive of this process and is not really creating additional barriers. In a nutshell, he's saying it would be a big mistake for crop life to dictate to countries their sustainability criteria, which affects small farmers. Therefore, government must do it through policies and legislation. You know, having worked in the private sector for many years, that it's so easy to mobilize the private sector, but then policy always lags behind. And I think, you know, coordinating that is, is a key here. Maybe that leads me actually to Anjali in the sense, I mean, you know, where do you see the most potential in uh, policies to catalyze, you know, a focus on regenerative agriculture as well? And policy has a very important role to play in all of this. Now we hear from the representative from chemical company Corteva on how best to direct government policy so farmers are forced to accept the emerging technologies onto their farms. There is the complexity in this system of access, access to tools, access to innovation at a localized level. There is the challenge of acceptance, which is really where policy and technological acceptance and regulatory frameworks play in. And then there's advancement, right? Continuous enablement to improve, to advance the opportunities, the tools, the solutions, the mechanisms that farmers need in order to be able to deliver on this great challenge that we are all a part of trying to address. And then finally, acknowledgement, which goes beyond our own value chain to recognizing that agriculture has been looked at and continues to increasingly be looked at here at COP27 as a contributor to solutions. There is a need, there is a dependency on the complexity of the system to be unlocked and tapped into, and that's where collaboration really fits in. But for policy, for policy, it's about access and enablement that does not prevent solutions from being advanced at a local level across the board because innovation for a regenerative future is absolutely critical. Corteva is so good at directing policy that they've become the founding partner of the new Zero Net Emissions Research Centre in Australia, which the Australian government has poured $87 million of public funds into to address agricultural emissions and sustainability. The chemical company's corporate capture of net zero policies couldn't be more obvious. And just a quick skim over some of the recent Australian government policies and plans, which support the implementation of the synthetic is sustainable agenda. National Statement on Climate Change in Agriculture. A climate smart, sustainable sector will help make farming more productive and profitable, better protect our environment, increase access to international markets and strengthen our farming communities. CSIRO, a national synthetic biology roadmap. In agriculture, synthetic biology offers potential for everything from alternative forms of meat protein to biosensors for farm monitoring. Australia endorses Emirates Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems and Climate Action. Australia has joined the Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems and Climate Actions at the UN Climate Change Conference COP28. More than 130 world leaders signed up to the landmark Agricultural Food and Climate Action Declaration, committing to integrate food into their climate plans by 2025. This strengthens and deepens the relationships we value across the many countries that have joined the call, which is about sustainably increasing agricultural productivity and driving future profitability, improving adaption and resilience to a changing climate and implementing pathways that support low emissions agriculture, that is, synthetic biology. Then there are the ways that farmers will be financially incentivized to adopt synthetic practices. 
under the carrot and stick approach, farmers are either rewarded or punished, depending on their support of the agenda. CGIAR representative Anna Maria explains this approach. And I would add to that the importance of thinking about incentives. So why are farmers going to implement some of the things that you were mentioning? And I, it was very interesting what you said in your presentation, that you said that how many months you were not receiving incomes? So those kind of things, it's, it's why, if I'm a farmer, why I would go for that? Because for me, it's, it's really much about incomes. It's really much having the right resources to put food in the plates of my kids. So I think that the incentives need to be at the heart of this discussion. And if we forget about those, then these solutions are never going to be scaled. And, and this is where the for-profit philanthropists really hit their stride. Major philanthropies urge massive scale-up of agroecology and regenerative approaches. Philanthropy is catalyzing pathways for transition to regenerative and resilient agriculture all over the world. Governments, the private sector and those that finance agriculture must now urgently work to support this shift and commit to investing in the people who manage our landscapes and grow our food and fibre, says the representative from the MacDoc Foundation. And the MacDoc Foundation is Prue Murdoch, who is the daughter of Rupert Murdoch and her husband. Another way of incentivizing farmers is uh, the example of Indigo Ag, a Corteva program. If you use Corteva's products, you can get more money through carbon credits. And because the big conglomerates are explicitly controlling the markets, Microsoft buys the Corteva carbon credits. And there you have the perfect trap. Farmers will have to keep using the Corteva products, which will keep advancing with newer synthetic biology technologies to keep their financial incentives. Corteva AgriScience creates new carbon and ecosystem services portfolio. Corteva's integrated approach with agronomy support, digital solutions, carbon advisory services and access to carbon markets will help farmers make impactful and sustainable changes that return economic and environmental benefits. The initiative builds on Corteva's strong history of putting farmers first. Then we have the ESG scoring agenda where companies need to account for the sustainability of the products they use or sell. The lower the company's ESG score, the more they are penalised. Remember, synthetic is now more sustainable. The World Business Council of Sustainable Development is a global CEO-led network of 200-plus leading sustainable businesses working together to accelerate the system's transformation needed to avert the climate emergency, restore nature and tackle inequality. This would have been seen previously as a corporate coup, a cornering of the market. Sustainable companies involved include chemical companies, the big four consultancy firms, big ag, tech companies, oil and coal companies and more. And their agenda is that stakeholders have to disclose and manage their emissions. So the same chemical companies that are selling their products under the cover of sustainability are part of a global network enforcing sustainability requirements on businesses. And this is all rolling out under the net zero commitments our governments have signed us up to. To illustrate how the Australian entities are busy selling out farmers, here is the National Farmers Federation Australian Agricultural Sustainability Framework, which will ensure that Australian farmers fall in line with international climate and sustainability initiatives. There's the Natural Capital Accounting by CSIRO, which is putting a price on ecosystems and nature. And the CSIRO, remember, put out the Synthetic Biology Roadmap for Australia. This is outside the scope of this video, but there are big plans to synthetically alter wild species, animals, trees, the whole ecosystem. And I'll just finish up on the incentivizing aspect with the Rockefeller Report, financing for regenerative agriculture. Philanthropists, large corporates and public funding are going to pave the way for regenerative agricultural transformations. Banks are going to give more favourable loans for farms to turn to regenerative farming practices. They will penalise farms who don't. Insurance companies will give more favourable cover for farms to turn to regenerative farming practice. They will penalise farms who don't. As I have shown over and over, regenerative agricultural principles are being used as the cover for the implementation of synthetic biology, nanomaterials and Internet of Things technology. This is the real agenda. 
And just so we don't forget, the impact investors rear their heads again by putting the funds through and receiving a financial return, all whilst virtue signalling. Internet of Things and the tracking and tracing of food systems hooking everything up to the internet so it can be analysed in real time. CGIAR representative Gian Piero explains. But we didn't mention the cultural uh, dimension that often is, uh, uh, is part of uh, the farmer uh, and that can be also considered when we design this policy it's not always uh, there right how can we eradicate these aspects uh, um, you know by convincing the farmers that they need to change these practices you know and uh, if we want to then deploy s such uh, approaches in um, areas that we they are not necessarily western countries right you know uh, we're talking about Ghana for instance how we talk to them and convince them uh, so this goes back to you know, collecting data and uh, use them as um, a solutions, w ways for um, developing uh, uh, tools for uh, decision uh, making. Which are How are they going to do this? New study shows AI and supercomputing can quantify greenhouse gas emissions from individual farms. This breakthrough is an official first step in developing a credible measurement, monitoring, reporting and verification of agricultural emissions. Groundbreaking platform builds digital twins that help farmers maximise yields and optimise sustainability. A partnership between the CSIRO, Microsoft and startup Agronomy to unlock data on farming practices. Meat and Livestock Australia recently launched a new environmental credentials platform, a user-friendly tool to measure sustainable production practices on farm. We've had a lot of conversation with banks, retailers and government agencies who want to measure their emissions. They refer to Scope 3 emissions, which is where the ESG scoring, where the banks and businesses need to account for anything, any product, any mortgage they've got on their books and the emissions. So this affects farms. Satellite imagery is used to ascertain farm practices, including carbon balance within the soil. Cortiva representative Anjali opens up an example of how the tracking and tracing of farm products is going to be implemented. And so with that, we have an understanding of the pressures, the concerns, the challenges of farmers, and we continue to launch programs continuously to get a better understanding and, and be better at amplifying what those challenges are. We have positive leaders program especially focused on farmers sharing their challenges in trying to adopt regenerative agriculture specifically. An example of a climate positive leaders program participant is David Stratum from Australia. He operates a 25,000 hectare cotton farm in New South Wales. It's called a regenerative farm. The Sundown Pastoral Company holds three projects, Good Earth Cotton, Fibre Trace and Miriam Vale. Good Earth Cotton is a carbon positive, sustainable, traceable, ethical company supported by Corteva that uses patented technology. Good Earth Cotton's fibres are independently certified as carbon positive, environmentally sustainable and fully traceable in real time throughout the entire supply chain. The technology embeds a transparent pigment ID into the raw fibre of garments, textiles or products. This unique authorization creates a digital passport containing the whereabouts, authenticity and accountability. The technology uses photon markers in fibre materials. The patent states rare earth ceramic pigment luminescent nanoparticle photon markers are mixed in specific proportions within cellulose slurry and extruded to form trace fibre strands. This is not a niche initiative. It's going to be mandatory for net zero and emissions targets. An update on integrating blockchain from farm to fork. It is crucial that organizations design food traceability architectures from farm to fork. So we've looked at how the global corporate entities are going to push farmers to move to so-called sustainable regenerative agricultural practices and looked at in the cold light of day, it's a blatant power play with very concerning agricultural practices. So how are they going to sell this complete takeover of farming to the naive public? The panelists outline four ways, climate change, through co-opting by local, social equity, and making it look farmer-led. 
Climate change has been covered extensively in this video up to this point. It's, it's the main justification that is used by the panellists. However, I think it's useful to unpack a little bit more regarding climate change and what is being touted as the saviour of the climate. Just going back to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization Strategic Framework 2022 to 2031, which I covered early in the video, where they talk about biotech, CRISPR, synthetic biology, digitalization as being the answers to the issues of climate. They discuss the importance of the transformation of the agri-food systems due to the Paris Agreement, which is the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. They talk about this new iteration of agriculture as being agriculture 4.0 um, from the fourth industrial revolution. Now the fourth industrial revolution is the melding of biology and technology together. From the article Zero Sum, the new colonialist food economy. This was in 2023. The global trade regime finalised details for a revolution in African agriculture. Under pending draft protocol on intellectual property rights, the trade bodies sponsoring the African continental free trade area seek to lock all 54 African nations into a punitive model of food cultivation. This protocol is the latest front in a global battle over the future of food. It seeks to institute legal and financial penalties through the African Union for farmers who fail to adopt foreign engineered seeds protected by patents, including genetically modified versions of native seeds. By allowing corporate property rights to supersede local seed management, the protocol is the latest front in a global battle over the future of food. The resulting seed economy would transform African farming into a bonanza for global agribusiness, promote export-orientated monocultures and undermine resilience. Farmers were particularly worried about the government's expected decision to green light a genetically modified variety of the cow pea, a staple of the West African diets. Was it possible, the farmers asked, that Ghanaian police could be empowered to imprison cowpea farmers for trading and refining unregulated native seed stocks? Here is the Plant Variety Protection Act 2020, Republic of Ghana. If a person offers for sale, sells or markets the propagating material of a variety protected in Ghana, they're looking at the minimum 10-year prison sentence maximum 15 years. The room fell silent as the information settled in the minds of the group. Farmers in northeastern Ghana have been cultivating the cow pea, a protein-rich legume that North Americans know as the black-eyed pea since the Bronze Age. How is it possible that people continuing to farm that lineage some 5,000 years later could face 15 years in prison for infringing property claims on crop varieties based on the local original? Just having a quick look at the funders and the players involved in the genetic engineering of cow pea, we find many of the same players that have been talked about and discussed previously in this video. First off, the CSIRO, boosting cow pea yield with biotechnology. We are developing high yielding modern cow pea varieties by combining insect resistance with enhanced photosynthetic capacity. We are also a partner of the Wright Project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. CSIRO again. We are part of a global project to improve cow pea production in Africa and are making progress towards incorporating built-in insect pest protection that could help to reduce food shortages in the region. The CSIRO was approached by the Network for Genetic Improvement of Cow Peas for Africa and the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. If you go to the Network for the Genetic Improvement of Cow Peas for Africa, first up comes up the Gates Foundation and donors and supporters include the Rockefeller Foundation, the Kirkhouse Trust, USAID and others. If we look at the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, we find out that they joined forces with the Bill and Melinda Gates Agricultural Innovations, partnering to strengthen research into improving staple crops grown by millions of African farmers. And then we have the CGIAR also working on genetic improvement of the cow pea. The Zero Sum article, The New Colonialist Food Economy, sums the situation up well. Development-minded agronomists have touted chemical and capital-intensive agriculture as the panacea for world hunger since the Green Revolution began in the 1960s. 
but the specific case they've made for replacing peasant cultivated seed varieties with patented versions developed in foreign laboratories has morphed over the decades. Today's rhetoric pivots on alleged concern over food security in an age of climate change. Western governments led by the US routinely deploy this language as they advocate seed improvement in countries like Ghana, one of the roughly half a dozen African nations to permit the sale of GMOs. What's going on here can be best summed up by George Carlin. Another way they're going to sell the synthetic transformation of our food systems is through co-opting by local. EY representative Alejandro explains. I'm going to talk about regenerative agriculture, you know, and in particular, is it really feasible that we start adopting a different approach to agriculture and still, you know, achieve a balance in our global food systems? COVID taught us a lesson. We are living in a VUCA world. We are getting more and more shocks coming in, not just from climate, but also geopolitical situations, diseases and so on. And our supply chains globally are not able to withstand this kind of shocks. Is it time that we start moving towards what we call, you know, just in case supply chains as well? What does that mean in agriculture for us? And I think COVID really highlighted also that it wasn't just our standard supply chains around pharmaceuticals, you know, emergency response materials that were failing, but that is already when we're facing the risk of our food chains collapsing as well. So the just-in-case supply chains um, references back to buying local and having local supplies, which is something that many in the organic food industry support. But what we think of when we hear buy local and what will be the reality are very different things. For example, the US Department of Agriculture invests $9 million in 10 organizations to support urban ag and innovative production. The US Department of Agriculture is partnering with To Improve Mississippi Economics. Minister an Urban Farm Outreach Program. Cindy Ayres Elliott is the president of TIME. Cindy was a New York investment banker. There's actually a surprising amount of people in the regenerative food space recently that were investment bankers. TIME partners with Kellogg's and Alcorn SDFR workshops. SDFR workshops are housed in a biotechnology building on a university campus and Kellogg's uses bioengineered ingredients in their food products. So this is what urban agriculture actually looks like. Big food monopolizing the space. Another way to sell this corporatized control of the food systems is to hide under the banner of social equity. Anna Maria from CGIR explains. Considering a social equity framework where we uh, believe that women, uh, youth, indigenous people need to be part of this and these solutions need to be fit for purpose for them. I think that it's very important in terms of thinking about this transformative adaptation. And the focus on women, youth, indigenous is just a tick box exercise to reach certain metrics. CGIAR, delivering genetic gains in farmers' fields, outlines how essential it is for women and disadvantaged groups to be involved in their plans. They state the issues are farmers using old seeds, that is not genetically engineered, or recycling seeds, that is using seeds from plants. They say these aren't fit for purpose for the consumer or the market. They go on to say the seeds, as is implied they're not genetically engineered, are more vulnerable to pests. The answer is climate smart intensification of food. That is, food produced from synthetic biology supplied by CGIAR partners. And here we have the map of how they override farmers' sovereignty. Of note is WP6 reaching the unreached with quality seeds and traits. Seed companies access and use new varieties tailored to their needs from CGIAR networks. Government partners in public policy design and implementation to actively promote policy solutions to accelerate varietal turnover, adoption and quality seed use. That is, government policy and legislation forces farmers to use the genetically edited seed. Seed partners use digital tools to evaluate, promote and track 
the adoption of these seeds by farmers. Seed companies increase their investments by baking new varieties of seeds from the seeds CGIAR removed from farmers as part of the green revolution. Farmers adopt climate resilient etc varieties more broadly and rapidly. The blatant strong arm tactics are then tied to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, come on, this is just so incredibly blatant. To water down this very obvious coup over farmers' sovereignty, there has to be a sprinkle of farmer-led fairy dust. We hear from Nelson, representing the Coalition of Farmers Ghana and the World Farmers Organization, and Anjali, representing Corteva, regarding how the farmer-led illusion is constructed. All the multi-stakeholders come to the table and speak for themselves. With farmers, others have to speak for them. The reason is lack of capacity for a bottom-up inclusive participation of farmers. They lack capacity. And so sometimes NGOs have to represent farmers. We need to have bottom-up capacity building, strengthening, for farmers and their institutions. However imperfect they are, and that is the argument I hear a lot. Oh, cooperatives have this problem, farmers organizations have this problem, but that is all that we have. Neglecting farmers institutions in form of cooperatives and organizations means you have to go around and look for individual farmers. And when your intervention is ended, they disperse, and you can't find them for follow-up. So you have got to deal with the existing institutions and help strengthen them. It's systems that need to be developed. And especially with experts, you have the capacity to develop their systems. So we do not need to neglect for, uh, um, institutional framework of farmers. And it involves developing systems, bottom up, transparent, accountable systems. These are expert related they can be bought and paid for if you get ey they will build farmers systemic capacity so we need to invest in these mechanisms and it means therefore that the solutions we've been lamenting about exist we want to lead we call it farmer initiated farmer led farmer sitting in the driver's seat you can think of every expression we want research to be demand driven. We want CGR to come to us and ask us what kind of research you want. As I was given an example, although in rural, rural Ghana, I also lead World Farmers Organization Innovation. You get a point? So that's how our institution is. I'm the one globally leading World Farmers Organization Innovation. And that's what you work on innovation technologies, etc. So next time when you want to do anything, CGR needs to consult with me. <laughs> For small farms, we have one collaboration where we are working with Land Lakes Venture 37 to support um, and contribute corn silage and training, so products, tools, and training to support women smallholder farmers to increase their livelihood. So what does this, how does this work? It's bringing the training, bringing the products, bringing the solutions so that in the practices they are already using to feed their dairy cows, to produce milk, that they're able to produce more in a more cost-effective or efficient way that allows them to bring more milk to market bring more of that income home and increase the overall livelihoods of themselves and their families. The partnership comes from private sector collaborating with capacity builders and technical assistance with the farmers providing their voice and 5,000 women smallholder farmers then benefiting from this, giving us the feedback and telling us how this needs to evolve. I think through the whole video, it has been very clear that small farmers are not a stakeholder within this partnership model. But just one final example of who is funding Venture 37, the example given by Corteva regarding smallhold farmers having a seat at the table. Surprise, surprise, we see the same private interests, Agra, chemical companies, Bill and Melinda Gates, etc. 
A question from an audience member where he asks the obvious surface question, why would the chemical companies be interested in regenerative agriculture? This question is asked with the assumption from the audience member that the panellists are using the same definition of regenerative agriculture as he uses. The audience member assumes regen agriculture minimises the use of synthetic materials and chemicals. Romano, representing CropLife, lets the audience member know that they are looking at this transformation from different angles. For CropLife, it is an opportunity to introduce a number of new technologies and new practices and hence will be very profitable. Yeah, it's perhaps a question to CropLife, uh, I would say. So we are cycling from uh, farm to farm, 7,000 kilometers, and we are visiting um, uh, regenerative agriculture farmers in EU, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, and uh, quite often the discussion happens is uh, from the farmer side, what about the agro agrochemical uh, kind of producing companies, you know, how are they planning to reduce their sales when it comes of development, because they're quite often are blocking a little bit the regenerative agriculture development. So that's just an uh, open question for you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, it seems to me that uh, you look at uh, uh, this transformation um, from uh, a slightly different point of view. We look at it uh, as an opportunity to really introduce uh, uh, a number of new technologies and new practices to discover innovation, but also tradition, because putting together crops and livestock is very much about the tradition, is very much about going at the origin of agriculture. All this is creating new value, and so there is space for, for the farmer to have a better profitability, to have more productivity, and for the rest of the private sector as well, probably to have as well uh, uh, a better profitability as well. I mean, this can really be a win-win. I don't see the contraposition that uh, you, you see there. I don't see that uh, uh, there is something negative for any of the stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder platform. The point, the key point for me is really to make sure that uh, we have access to a broad uh, 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 group of technologies, group of practices, and that we can uh, count on the support of uh, the policy. That needs also to give access to new investments, because we are talking about uh, our technologies, but in reality, I think the central point is what Nelson said. I mean, he needs first to understand what are the benefits for implementing a certain approach, and probably he needs also, uh, according to what uh, Jean-Pierre was saying, a financial element that could help these investments. So a man from a global organics body is hopeful that CGIR is serious about this new approach. He is assured by the CGIR spokesperson that they are going to do things differently now. If different means top-down, centralised control over the world's food systems, I guess he's right. Uh, Gabor Figetsky, I from Organics International, the global umbrella for organic farming. <clears throat> On the one hand, we are very happy to see now this move uh, in the policy um, and vision of CGIR. And we really hope that this is something serious. Because uh, what, what we have seen in the past is that something somewhat less than 1% of research funding goes into organic, regenerative, agroecological. We don't care about the, the words. Um, I wonder if you do. Uh, <laughs> um, but this, this has been a fact. And we have always been advocating for, for more research funding for, for these, um, these practices of agriculture. Simply the practices. We are not advocating for certified organic. Just the practices, just like you outlined here. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is going to, this is the new direction and this is really happening. Also on the, on the policy science interface, I also hope that this will really come responsibly from CGIR that you will really be partnering us in advocating to policymakers how important extension services uh, are to build capacities for farmers to be able to take up these practices and, and understand how they work with nature instead of against it. Um, 
maybe you could also comment on why why you pick up the term regenerative and not all the others. <laughs> I would be interested to, to hear some thoughts from the panelists. Um, and lastly, again, about um, the big companies. I would also be interested to really learn from you how we could scale up those businesses that actually support this transformation, who produce organic inputs, for example, or you know, uh, those, those uh, startups who uh, also do capacity building to farmers uh, in composting and various other uh, practices. As CGIR centers, and at the moment it's 12 of us are coming together under this new model, we launched a portfolio that's a, you know, with a view of meeting a 2030 strategy. And this portfolio is definitely not business as usual for CGIR. We have CGIAR 2030 is about powerful multi-stakeholder partnerships, synthetic is sustainable narratives, intensive surveillance on farm, tracking and tracing of products through the supply chain, patented seeds and biotechnology. Is that being here in a pavilion with FAO, that's an intergovernmental, very important organization, means that CGIR is getting closer to the key organizations that can be fed with our evidence, our knowledge, etc. so that interface between science and policy is more effective over time. So not just... The FAO is as far from organic food as you can get. They are proponents of biotechnology and synthetic biology. To speed up the synthetic transformation of the Australian food systems and to ensure that pesky regulations do not interfere with corporate interests, the Australian New Zealand food body for ZANS is in process to amend the definition of GMO to allow a wide range of GMOs to be in the Australian food market without safety testing or labelling. This amendment, if it goes through, will mean that GMOs are in organic food and we will be none the wiser. Pazan's position is that the process by which food is made is irrelevant. Only the end product is what is to be considered. The first lab meat to be allowed into the Australian food market is making its way through the Pazan's process. It's lab quail created from cells from quail embryos. The cells are then grown in a mixture of barley infused with pig genes. By Fizanza's definition, the lab quail product is the same as quail if similar amounts of synthetic vitamins and minerals are added into the lab quail to marry up with the vitamins and minerals in quail. This argument is nonsensical. Additionally, the Australian government is working on changing the Gene Technology Act 2000. Here are clips from a webinar held on the changes. My name is Rachel from the TGA Learn within the Regulatory Engagement Branch. Let's get started on today's presentation with our first speaker, Sarah Syme, the Assistant Secretary of the Regulatory Engagement Branch at the Department of Health and Aged Care. Her responsibilities include gene technology policy and governance. Research and developments in gene technology are expanding with applications in agriculture, including pest control, medical research and commercial therapies, biomanufacturing and species conservation. Biotechnologies, including synthetic biology, have been listed as critical technology in the national interest. Both the Commonwealth and state governments have identified biotechnology as a crucial area of investment. The proposed amendments will diminish the complexity of the current regulatory system and perceived lack of flexibility for new or emerging product, reducing barriers to innovation previously identified by stakeholders. Protection of threatened species, management of feral animals and weeds, and sustainable agriculture are key areas where gene technology can make substantial contributions to the environment. Vaccines that protect Australian fauna from disease are being developed with gene technology and the development of genetically modified crops that have increased yields with less energy input will make, help make agriculture more sustainable by reducing carbon emissions. I'll now hand over to Kirsteen McGee to take you through the material in the consultation paper in more detail. As identified by the third review, the pace of scientific discovery in the field of gene technology is accelerating. 
key definitions in the Gene Technology Act that establish which GMO activities are within the scheme have become outdated. This can lead to uncertainty surrounding the regulation of new technology, which can both stifle innovation and diminish the scheme's ability to manage emerging risks. The review also recommended clarifying that human beings are not considered to be GMOs for the purposes of the scheme. In this webinar, we learned that the Australian government thinks, to quote, sustainable agriculture is a key area where gene technology can make substantial contributions to the environment. The Australian government has listed biotechnologies, including synthetic biology, as critical technology in the national interest. The gist is that the current protections offered in the legislation are impeding progress and innovation and stakeholders, that is commercial interests, want the regulatory requirements simplified so they can genetically edit wild species, pests, feral animals, threatened species. They want to create gene technology injections for fauna and have an open door for genetically edited seeds to create purportedly a sustainable future. The claims that extensive genetic intervention in the natural world is needed because genetically altering, patenting, centrally controlling natural life is more sustainable is incredibly disturbing. This narrative is being orchestrated by the funders and beneficiaries of the toxic green revolution. This synthetic biology experiment of mammoth proportions is being unleashed with so few people aware and has enormous repercussions from the food we eat to animals to the ecosystem and environment. I want to finish up with clips from a 1980s documentary called Fragile Harvest where they document the connection between seed banks, biotech, patenting and centralisation of food systems, decreased nutrition, extensive chemical usage and the global takeover of food systems. And we will see a biotechnician claiming that genetically edited food is more nutritious, increases the quality of food and extends shelf life, leading to a positive impact on the consumer. The same shtick that CGIAR, CropLife, Food and Agricultural Organization, Rockefeller, Gates Foundation, etc., are trying on us today. With the added surveillance technologies and ESG scoring, which means this will be a complete takeover. Sorry, you don't get to go from the green revolution is essential to feed the world to a couple of statements of oopsie, the green revolution had a lot of unintended effects, the poisoning of the environment for one. So, Trust us as we bring in new technologies and finish our decades-long takeover of the global food systems. In Peru, potatoes come in more shapes and colors than North Americans are used to. It's because they're at home here. Peru, like Turkey, is one of those rich corners of the world where many of our food plants first evolved. Several thousand years of cultivation here have produced a startling demonstration of nature's ingenuity. Beans, squash, potatoes, corn, tomatoes, ancient treasures of Peru that have enriched the world. They come from small farms in the mountainous countryside where life still follows traditional patterns. Remote areas like this are the source of genetic raw material modern crops depend on. Dr. Charles Rick is a world expert on tomato genetics. He's here with an international group of breeders looking for wild tomato varieties. Hiding in the corner. Collections like these are stored in an international network of seed banks set up to conserve the genetic basis of the world's food. DNA Plant Technology Corporation is one of many new companies so redesigning plants, plants for the food industry. Dr. David Evans is a biotechnologist. Well, I guess our next step is to try to increase the regeneration frequency. Biotechnology has attracted business investment because it promises such control. Now, living plants like these can be privately owned. Recent laws in many Western countries allow new varieties to be protected by patent. I think what is new and exciting 
uh, is that some of these tools of biotechnology permit us to address more intelligently issues like nutrition, uh, quality of food characteristics, uh, shelf life considerations, things which will have a very positive impact, uh, a very positive social impact uh, on the consumer in the next several years. So clearly I would say that the work that we're doing in linking uh, science to business uh, is extremely rewarding. The processing tomato, it's been created for industry by plant breeding. Tough skin, high yield, simultaneous ripening, and now there's a new goal, increasing the solids content through biotechnology. Competition is fierce. Every percentage point of extra solids means nearly 80 million dollars for the processing industry. But there's always a trade-off. Already, the new tomato has 15% less vitamin C. Farming is now an international affair, and the seed business is becoming big business. For agricultural economist Pat Mooney, the new seed merchants are a matter for urgent concern. The real plant breeders today are multinational corporations, uh, particularly multinational uh, chemical corporations. There have been close to a thousand seed company takeovers in the last uh, dozen years, and uh, which means that basically all of the traditional uh, multi-generational uh, family seed companies that have served uh, the, the market for, for, for decades and, and centuries in some cases have been taken over by these international companies. And I think that's a concern that when you have that concentration in a few hands. But secondly, we should be concerned because these companies are the uh, uh, pesticide manufacturers, the pesticide developers who are now becoming the plant breeders. Chemical and agriculture. It's a growing partnership. Seeds are now bred to respond to chemicals. They need them to perform. Rising costs trap the farmer in a race for higher yields. Herbicide companies are currently spending millions of dollars in plant breeding programs trying to develop herbicide resistant varieties of these crops. More herbicide means higher yields and fatter business profits. But already in the American Corn Belt, Toxic quantities of herbicide are showing up in drinking water. Farming has always been a risky business, but help is now at hand. There's a chemical solution to most problems in the field. For the farmer, the message is simple. Shell, DuPont, Roman Haas and Monsanto will guard his fields for him. They'll wrap his defenseless crop from seed to harvest in a petrochemical shield, keep it safe from the hazards of nature. For food companies, plant breeding provides tight control over the production end of their operation. The food chain is becoming an assembly line that starts with the seed and ends in the can. This is the new look of tomato farming in Peru. Hectares of processing tomatoes developed in Italy and the U.S have replaced the locally adapted varieties. All that genetic diversity is lost to the crops it helped to create. Human harvesters work among plants raised in the family of agricultural chemicals. Genetically uniform, the plants are vulnerable to epidemics. This crop is damaged by pinworm and a virus infection. It's already been dusted for fungus. The billboards are Spanish, but the names are familiar. Imported seed means imported fertilizers and pesticides. But the new tomato has caught on here. Understandably, the farmers like its high yield and its durability. Now the consumers are the ones that must adapt. Today, in the market, where tomatoes once came in many shapes, colors, and flavors, only the processing tomato is for sale. Here, where the tomato first evolved, the legacy of generations has disappeared in 20 years, eliminated by agribusiness and its new international seed. We are living in a world of smoke screens and illusion, one where what is discussed on the surface differs from the real agenda. 
I made this video in an attempt to help regenerative farmers become aware that the principles of regenerative ag are being used as a cover to bring in the next iteration of big ag. And this time, the chemical companies and their cronies have worked out a way to make their technologies mandatory for all. It is essential that those of us who grow organic food, those of us who want to purchase organic, truly regenerative food, and those of us who want to see true autonomy for small farmers pull back the illusion, understand the real threats, have the right conversations, and get active. Politicians are you. Sharpening.